scrotal swelling today and especially the scrotal swellings and there are 10 of those right so we'll see how we reach a diagnosis and what are the peculiarities so that by the end of the talk uh, we are very well versed with all the 10 pathologies that are there to be learned in scrotal swellings we know what is the pathophysiology, why this is happening, why patient is presenting the way he is presenting, and what are the principles of treatment then. So it's a very intensive menu. So bear with me. Okay? Right. So now this is in this way, in this order, that for example, a patient comes to you, right, and he says that he has got a swelling in his inguinoscrotal region. Right? The patient will not exactly give you a diagnosis. He will tell you, uh, look, doctor, I've got a swelling in my sort of uh, scrotum, right? And, uh, well, it has been getting larger since so much uh, time and whatever, and it is bothering me or not bothering me or whatever, if it is painful or not. So the patient comes with actually a scrotal swelling. Now, our problem is, first of all, to know what it is to diagnose it, right? Now, this diagnosis of inguinoscrotal swelling actually runs on a scheme of dichotomy learning, that we ask ourselves a question, and that bifurcates the possibilities into two. And then we ask ourselves another question, and another, another, and as you can see on the board, I will ask me and you only four questions, and we'll reach the diagnosis, right? So the first question is, because the patient has got a swelling, for example, in the right testis, because I've drawn a right testis for your attention, right? So we'll talk about only the right testis. The other side is identical, right? So patient has got a swelling in the large swelling in the scrotum, for example, right? right? And I, the first question I need to ask as a physician to myself is, can I get above the swelling? That is a very important question. Say, for example, this is the scrotal swelling, and this is suspended, or still better, sorry. If this is the scrotal swelling, for example, right? So you know the scrotum has got spermatic cord. Now I ask myself, can I get above the swelling that I pinch the swelling, pinch, 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 till I can go to the cord, which feels absolutely normal. So I can tell that whatever the abnormality is now below my fingers and above that is a normal cord. So I have gotten above the swelling. The whole swelling is below my two fingers, right? So can I get above the swelling? So if I can get above the swelling, it means whatever is causing the problem, whatever the swelling is, is a total scrotal affair. So it is totally a scrotal thing, whatever is the content of the scrotum, which basically is testis and appetitis. But if I cannot get above the swelling, that the swelling continues and continues and continues, I keep on feeling and palpating and cannot reach an end of that, then it means that the swelling is traveling from the testes along the spermatic cord and is vanishing somewhere into the abdomen. And that can only be hernia. But because we are not discussing hernia today, so we'll not talk about hernia anymore. But first question settles the first query. That if a patient has got a swelling in the right test, right scrotum, and I can get above it so that I can, for example, if this is the testis, and go and pinch. I'm able to pinch the top of the testis, and then there's a normal spermatic cord, then this is a totally scrotal swelling. And if it is not finishing anywhere, it is just going on and on and disappearing into the inguinal canal, then this is not a pure scrotal swelling. This is an inguinoscrotal swelling. This is an inguinoscrotal swelling, which means that this is a hernia. So I ask myself first question, can I get above the swelling? The answer can be yes or no. So if the answer is no, I cannot get above, the swelling is just going on and on, then it's a hernia. And the further examination should follow the protocol of a hernia examination. And we will not talk about that anymore now, because we are concerned only about the scrotal swellings. 
But if the answer is yes, I can get above the spelling. So as I mentioned, that it means that this is a pure scrotal spelling. The next question that I ask, is the spelling painful? Because there are only two answers. Either it's a painful spelling or it's a painless spelling. So if the spelling is painful, then these are the three possibilities. And if it is painless, right, then we have to go further. So for example, let's concentrate on this that yes, that the I can get above the swelling, so thereby it's a scrotal swelling. And number second is that this is painful. We need to deal with painful swellings first anyway, because they are tender, they are uncomfortable, so you need to be careful. You cannot go into detailed examination. The patient won't let you either, right? So if the swelling is painful, then the possibility is that patient either has a torsion or an orchitis or an epididymoarchitis. These are the most common causes of painful testicular swelling, unless patient has a definitive other reason, for example, trauma. Then patient will tell that he fell off, or he was sort of playing cricket and he was hit by a ball, or somebody kicked him in the testes or crouch, whatever. Right? So that is actually not a diagnostic dilemma at all. We are talking about diagnostic dilemma, that the patient has got a purely testicular uh, scrotal swelling. And the second question is, is it painful? The answer comes yes. So these are the three possibilities. Right? Now, these three possibilities you can remember as toe, torsion, orchitis, and epididymoarchitis. Now, first of all, concentrate on torsion. How, what does torsion is, and how does it play? Now, before we discuss any of these, <coughs> let's revise our anatomy a little bit. I have drawn for you here the right testis, right? That is a bladder, urethra, and the penile urethra, that is a prostate thing, and these are the two seminal vesicles. There would be a left testis here, but I have omitted it because only need to concentrate on one. So that is the right testis, right? As I mentioned to you. Now this right testis has got an epididymis. Now you need to know that epididymis is stuck onto the testis like that. So there's a testis and there's epididymis and it is stuck onto that. But these are two separate things. Even developmentally, testes develop separately and epididymis develops separately. They then come together, they come closer and closer, and then they have to establish connection between each other. Now you see that the testes has got some 20, 30, 40 lobulations, and each lobulus contains smaniferous ducts, the ducts that manufacture spermatozoa. Right? Now, these, uh, these maniferous ducts have to open into the epididymis because whatever they are manufacturing has to be conveyed to the epididymis. It connects with the epididymis through these small tubes. These are called vas efferentia. These are vas efferentia. These are very small tubes. But you can see that something is going from testis into the epididymis, so there has to be mesentery, there has to be a path to cross, like gut mesentery. All the vessels, lymphatic nerves, pass from posterior abdominal wall into the gut through a mesentery. So it's a mesentery. So there is a very short mesentery. The, in real sense, actually, the epididymis is actually stuck onto it, and there's a very small distance between the two. But distance is there, and that distance is bridged by was afferentia, which are actually transporting the spermatozoa from the spaniferous tubules into the epididymis, right? And then epididymis, in turn, collects all the, uh, proto uh, the spermatozoa and then is coiled. It then is single duct and then is coiled. But it is a single tube. It's coiled, but it's a single tube. To understand that, you remember the olden days telephone sets, right? They, they used to have a cradle and a receiver, and the receiver was connected to the cradle by a wire which was sort of spring-like coil so that you can pull it and release it, right? So this is like a telephone receiver wire. It is coiled and coiled and coiled and coiled and coiled. So you, if you undo it, it's really, really, very long, right? This much length is required for spermatozoa to mature in it, right? So nature, what nature has done, instead of sort of wrapping it around the patient itself, it has wrapped the duct onto itself, so there's a sort of a coiled, curled duct, but it's a single duct. The most important thing is that 
This is a single duct or you can say single wire. For example, from this electrical button to that bulb, a single wire is going there. You know, a set of wires. Go if you cut that wire anywhere, right, the connection will be disconnected and the bulb will sort of go off. This is same that if you damage this anywhere, if you cut it anywhere, the conveyance of spermatozoa from this testis to the urethra will stop. Because this is a continuous duct, okay? The other thing is that this duct will go and enter into the urethra and not only contribution comes from here, that is from the testes, the contribution also comes from the seminal vesicle and prostate and these three combine to make what is called semen, right? So semen is not entirely a contribution of testes. Testes only make one component, obviously a very important component of it, but one component. Other component come from there. So this is the anatomy of it. Now the thing is that what happens during torsion? Right? During torsion, actually, it is a genetic error. Some people are born with genetic error, like some people are born with cleft lip. Right? They have got a cleft lip. So the lift is cleft, the, the palate is cleft, they have got six fingers, or they have got the fused fingers synd syndically, or whatever. So there are various type of abnormalities or variations, you can say. Similarly, people can be tall, people can be short, people can be dark or fair. So some people have a long mesentery, a very long mesentery. Instead of having short mesentery, they have long mesentery. So if standardly that is a testis and that is the epididymis practically stuck onto the testis, in this case what happens that this is the testis and epididymis is fairly far away, right? Resulting in a condition that, uh, now these are was afferentia connecting, now these are the was afferentia connecting. Now what is the problem? The problem is that the test is, is far away from the epididymis. Normally epididymis is practically stuck. Now epididymis is here. So torsion takes place between the epididymis and the testis because the mesentery is very long. Torsion does not take place at this level, right? Torsion is not at the level of the cord, right? It does not sort of the whole testes and epididymis complex does not twist. Epididymis stays where it is. The testes go round. See, it is very important to understand because when you are operating, you have to undo the testes, right? And then stick it to that and stick it to the scrotum, right? You need to then put a stitch from not only undo it, stitch it to scrotum so that it does not retwist. Now that is what happens. How does the patient present? Right? First of all, these patients present normally between the ages of 10 to 15. It can happen earlier, it can happen later. But as the age progresses, usually the incidence, the prevalence goes down and down. This is the highest prevalence age, 10 to 15, because this is a time when the baby is in the child or the boy is in class 5, 6 grade, right? And that is when they are getting more and more independent and physically active, right? They're jumping, they're playing basketball, cricket, football, running around, climbing the trees. That is when actually the sudden movement causes a torsion of the testis, right? So the age is from 10 to 15, and the history is dramatic. Mother tells you that the boy was running around and I was telling her him not to, he was jumping above the wall and down, or above the cupboard and down, and what happened that he jumped above the cupboard and back and then sat down and never got up. He cried, it went into severe bout of pain, and since then he is in pain and he will not straighten up, right? Up till now, he is sitting like this. He will not let anybody see or touch his crouch. So it's a dramatic history because suddenly there's a torsion, right? So age is this, 10 to 15. Episode happens very suddenly, right? Because, and usually there's a history that the boy was doing a very violent physical activity just before that, during which this all happened. Now, when you examine this patient, 
the boy will not let you even touch him when you gain confidence even then he will not let you touch the pain uh, the the side which is affected because it's very painful the trick is to touch the other side because you see please follow me if somebody has for example most of us have got black or dark eyes brown or black right because we being asians have got black or uh, dark eyes if somebody has got for example example blue eyes he's coming from peshawar he has got blue eye the right eye is blue what do you think would be the color of the left eye blue so if he has got misentry on one side he will have misentry on the other side so please feel the other side and you will be surprised god what's happening normally the epididymis is stuck onto the you can feel it a little groove you can i mean you can make out that testes and epididymis are two separate structures but they are very too close together in this case they are very separate you can actually pinch your finger between them which means that they have got a long misentry so this baby immediately needs to undergo surgical exploration in an attempt to untwist and save the testes but if the testes is dead black then you have to take it out but please never ever forget to fix the other testes because a person who has got misentry on one side and has a torsion on that side is waiting to have a torsion on the other side okay and the story does not end here what if i tell you that i had a cousin right and he was from uh, our far away relatives and he was from peshawar and his eyes were blue and we were fascinated with blue eyes one day his cousin came surprise surprise cousin's eyes were blue as well are you surprised no why because they are related they first cousins or if i say his brother came he too had blue eyes i mean people have resemblance you sometime meet somebody say god you resemble are you his brother i say yeah 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 i'm his brother right so features they resemble this too is a feature so you not only have to identify this is torsion because of the age group because of the suddenness because of the history that there was a violent activity just before that patient not let the let you touch on that side but on the other side you can feel a misentry right then the answer is to immediately explore and if the test is on untwisting becomes pink and viable fine fix it right and if not take it out if it is necrosed already but never forget to fix the other side because that too is under risk okay and then ask the family that all the boys who are in first generation relation for example like another younger brother or a brother who is 2 year older he is still in the same bracket if this boy is 11 the elder brother would be 13 he still is at risk so call everybody and the maternal cousins right because they too are related ask them to bring them for examination and if you find large misentries advise the parents that they need their test is fixing okay anything difficult right grand we move on to the other thing which is orchitis please remember that this is different from epididymal orchitis orchitis is just the orchitis epididymis is all right patient has got orchitis and this is usually mumps orchitis it can happen with various viral infections but most commonly takes place after mumps right so there is uh, the age group is little different very rarely it can happen before puberty you see this is the age of puberty when the boy is in class 9 10 right girls get the puberty little earlier boys get little later so this is the normal age for puberty so soon after puberty the 10 years are risky years that is when they get if they get mumps they will get mumps orchitis as well right and why do they get mumps orchitis they get mump because mump is here why the virus should go and attack the testes and an other thing is if patient had mumps for example in beginning of january the orchitis will be maybe 7 8 10 12 14 there is later when the mump is actually settling right the parents were very happy thanks god he is better maybe he will be going school maybe in a couple of days and suddenly patient complains no no i have got testis um, a pain in my testis not only that not only that it is usually bilateral affecting both sides right now the question comes to mind how come virus affect testis 
So please remember, it's not the virus itself. It's not the viremia. Virus is long dead and gone. Right? You know that most of the viral ailments are self-limiting. In 10, 12, 14 days, max three weeks, they are gone. Because, and why they are gone? Because body makes natural immunity against the viruses. But for example, if somebody contracts virus today, it will take body 10, 12 days to make antibodies and then go and fight virus and then the virus will be eradicated and then the patient will start getting better. But these antibodies somehow match a protein in the testes as well. Some of the viral proteins are very similar to some of the testicular proteins. So what happens when body manufactures antibodies against the virus, they are also effective against the testicular protein. So they cross a testicular barrier and on one hand in the blood they are in blood and in the protein they are killing the mumps virus. On the other hand, they are entering the testes and causing orchitis. That is why patient has got orchitis, not epididymal orchitis. Epididymis is perfect. And because it's a humoral thing, the antibodies are in the blood, there's no reason that they are going into the right and will not go into the left testes. But they sometimes don't. I mean, it, it can be unilateral, bilateral, but it's likely that it would be bilateral. And you're surprised, why bilateral? I mean, God. So it is not a viral infection, it is, an, it is an immune reaction against virus which was supposed to eradicate the virus and it did eradicate the virus but it is not damaging the testes as well. So what is the history now that you have got a boy now, right? Well, he's not a boy, he's actually becoming a man, 15 to 25 year of age group, right? Usually soon after puberty, two, three years, right? So he gives a history that he had a mumps, or parent gave a history, and usually there's a history even before that, that there was an outbreak of mumps in the school. Many children fell sick and the school was sort of, uh, was closed or the, the boy was given a forced leave, no, the boy has got a mump, please take him away for four or five days because he will infect everybody else. And then he got mumps and he had difficult time countering with that. Now that he was getting better, suddenly now he's for the last day or so complaining pain in the testis. Right? So this is what the pathophysiology is. And that is why, because this is a humoral, this is the antibody in the blood, it will get anywhere the blood goes. So blood goes into both testes, so it is likely that he will get a bilateral orchitis. Right? Now because it's an immune reaction, what should be the treatment? Antivirals? No, the virus is already dead. Antibiotics? It's not bacterial. It's immunity, right? So immunosuppressants, steroids. So steroid and non-steroidal uh, uh, non anti-inflammatory for pain relief. So probably a combination of brufen and uh, uh, steroid will do the trick. So that is what it is. But you need to be very careful because if you are not careful, then the testes are enclosed, the capsule of the testes called tunica albuginea is very tight, it's non-stretchable. If the inflammation goes very bad and the swelling is very bad, the testes bilaterally can necrose and the boy can become infertile for the rest of his life. So you need to be very careful if baby complains of pain in the testes. If, it's, if, if it is not responding to simple treatment, you may have to do the surgery and the surgery would be to slit the tunica albuginea all the way around. So that the capsule is broken and it has a space to stretch and it will then go back. Right, so that is orchitis. Now note the age group is changing. The third is epididymal orchitis. Now again patient has got an inflammation. But now it is epididymal orchitis, both epididymis and testes are inflamed. And what comes first? Epididymal and then orchitis. So need to understand that inflammation starts from epididymis and spreads to orchitis, right? Starts from here and goes there. It, this is actually a retrograde infection coming from urethra, right? Now there are two possible big large groups. There are many causes, but there are two large causes. The most common cause and the most common age group is as you can see 20 to 35 the most common cause is sexually transmitted disease. 
right? Patient has got urethritis due to some reason, chlamydia, gonorrhea, whatever, right? The various type of microorganisms that can cause sexually transmitted. So he has contracted an infection which has resulted in urethritis and the, from urethra, oh no, actually there are two vases, one going to the left and one is going to the, one is going to the left and one is going to the right. Now, theoretically, see, it's a chance that whether it will ascend to the right or the left epididymis. So that chance plays, right? That chance plays. For example, there's fire in this hall, God forbid, and there are two galleries. The fire can go into both, but if the fans are working there, it's, there, it's more likely to go there, right? So thereby, most of the time, it is a unilateral phenomena. Per chance, per chance, the infection travels either left or right way, right? But when it is going, it is causing, first of all, inflammation of the spermatic cord called funiculitis. So initially, the pain is there, and then it is descending, and then the epididymis is involved, and then the testis is involved, and the whole complex is sore. But unlike torsion, it will not happen suddenly. The patient will have a sexual contact, the infection will get established in the next three, two, three, four days, then that infection will cause severe posterior urethritis, then one good day it will ascend in one of the walls, and then reach the whole thing. So it will take maybe three, four, five days, uh, even a week or maybe later, after the contact, right? And usually it's unilateral. And this is the age group, right? So it is, it's, the age group starts from 20, because that is mostly, well, boys can be sexually active before that, but this is when they are usually most sexually active, right? It usually sort of weans off at 35. Not that he is getting inactive sexually, he is only getting wiser. He needs, he knows that I need to sort of take certain precaution and stuff, right? So, that is why he has learned his lesson, having three, four, five episodes of orchitis and the, and, 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 and the prevalence and weans off after 35. So that is what is happening. So this is a bacterial infection. So this is a mechanical thing. It is a twist. This is viral, but not viremia due to immunity against the virus. So this is an immune-mediated thing. And this is a bacterial infection, ascending, retrogradely ascending infection from urethra. Right? So patient gives you the history. And if you examine the testes, the one testes would be swollen, would be painful, not as painful as torsion. Not as painful as, but it's depending on what stage of disease you see them, it can be fairly uh, sore and painful. And please wear gloves because the patient is still sort of very contagious. Patient may still have a chlamydia or gonorrhea on his uh, urethra. And if you sort of uh, do that to the uh, penile tip, sort of on the urethra, you may be able to see a drop of pus. And if you send urine or that drop of pus, it would be teeming with microorganisms. That will prove that yes, patient has got urethritis. So this is the commonest cause, but there is an other common cause as well for urethritis. And that is hospital bone, mostly. And that is when we are doing any retrograde procedure. For example, there's an old man and he's getting epididymoarchitis. It is unlikely it is sexually transmitted. What is happening is probably the patient had benign prostate or something, somebody tried to insult a foley, did not observe the sterilization techniques or whatever. So retrogradely the infection was introduced because of instrumentation. That too is very common, but this is a common cause, probably the commonest cause of epididymoarchitis in hospital setting. And that is the community setting. If the patient comes from home and has got epididymoarchitis, probably this is sexually transmitted. Okay. So this is if the patient had a painful swelling. Now, if the patient did not have a painful swelling, in that case, I ask myself the third question, right? The swelling is not painful. Patient is allowing me to touch it, to manipulate it, no issue, with a little bit of explanation that, OK, I'm going to help you gain the confidence. And then you can examine the patient fully. And now my question is, is this swelling, if it is not painful, is it cystic? And cystic too in a way that it is cystic and transluminant, right? Because sometimes cyst contains blood. That will not transluminate because the blood is opaque, right? So is it cystic? 
So I do a translumination. If it is brightly transluminating, like a Chinese lamp, right? you have got a lamp and a bulb inside, and you light the bulb, and the whole globe sort of shines. The whole globe shines. Then patient has got a transluminant swelling. So the possibilities are two. And if you are not sure, you can go on to doing ultrasonography, which will immediately confirm it is cystic or not. Right? It's very easy to do. But most of the time, if you do translumination right, you don't need to go to that. But you can, if you wish, just to reconfirm. Now again, the possible answers are two, yes or no, right? If no, there are other possibilities, we leave it for a minute. If yes, there are these three possibilities. Patient either has a hydrocele, or has a spermatocele, or has a cyst of the apodidmus. So how we differentiate them, right? For example, let's start with the hydrocele because it is the commonest. Now to understand hydrocele, I need to take you through to this. This is how testis develops. Testis descend, right, and pinch off a portion of peritoneum with it, right? So they acquire a membrane like lungs have got pleura on it, heart has got pericardium on it. The concept is very simple. Testis is, is like a solid sort of globe, right? And you have got a balloon. This blue thing is a balloon, which is a pinched off portion of peritoneum. Now, what you are trying to do is that you have got a balloon and you have got a solid testis. You are trying to, testis comes and first of all touches this globe. And then it tries to, somebody is trying to push it into the balloon. See, you are trying to push it into the balloon. You push, 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 till what happens that the surface in contact with the testes here, and that is a surface that is not in contact with the testes, but actually it is the same ball, it's the same balloon. The balloon which is touching the testes, we call it visceral layer. And the layer which reflects and goes there is the parietal layer. But this whole sort of a ball into which you have invaginated the testes is Right? For example, look at this. If this is a sheet and this is a test, is my. So that is what it is doing. Right? So this part of the sheet that is immediately touching the test is, is visceral, and the sheet which is away from it but is continuous with the rest is parietal. Right? And there's a cavity between it. Now, what happens is that this, this becomes a separate cavity. It has got its own system of drainage and sort of uh, manufacturing. So what is happening is that body is this, this tunica vaginalis is manufacturing fluid. And then it has got an absorption system as well. Now there can be two, for example, somebody was playing and had a kick in the crouch. Then there is an inflammation, acute inflammation of the testes. Now you know during inflammation what happens, the capillaries start leaking. So this is overproduction of the fluid. So you will get accumulation of fluid in the tunica vaginalis, and we get, this is called hydrocele. So the one way of getting hydrocele is by overproduction, right? So overproduction can be if there's an inflammation. For example, we have just read uh, epididymoarchitis, there's inflammation, bacterial inflammation. In that case as well, there would be some amount of fluid accumulating in it. Because of the inflammation, because inflammation causes vasodilatation and leakage of capillaries. So thereby the fluid will seep into it and will get a fluid. So that is one way of getting hydrocele. But most common type of hydrocele that we see is what is called an idiopathic, that we do not know what is the cause, right? But we know only this, this much we do know that the cause is not production. The problem is with absorption. Because if you are producing, for example, 3 ml a day, you need to absorb 3 ml a day. If you are do, producing 3 ml a day and absorbing 2.5 ml a day, then you are accumulating 0.5 ml a day. And over a period of, say, for example, one month, you will have a 15 ml of hydrocele. So you have to match your production with your absorption. So if it is an inflammatory condition, for example, a physical trauma, an infection, etc., that causes hydrocele by increasing production, right? The treatment is very simple, reverse the cause. 
If it is because of epididymoarthritis, treat epididymoarthritis. If it is because of trauma, give anti-inflammatory. And as the pain will settle, the inflammation will settle and the hydrocele will settle. But if it is primary, then the problem is reverse. Right? Tunica vaginalis is producing its normal amount of fluid, but it is not absorbing, reabsorbing it. So a little bit is collecting now. So much so that he can have a huge ball full of fluid. Right? So that is hydrocele, that is the primary hydrocele. So we have to do something in treatment to improve the reabsorption, right? So this is the concept of the operation. Now this is testis, this is epididymis, and the blue thing is the tunica vaginalis, which is full of fluid, right? Now the inner cavity is producing the inner layer, the inside, not that side, the inside, because if fluid is produced from there, it will be absorbed in the tissue, right? The inside of tunica vaginalis is producing fluid, for example, 3 ml a day, but absorbing only 2.5 ml a day. We have to do something about absorption. So, the, the principle of the operation is that you open it. See, I've given an NCN and opened it into two leaves, right? And reverse it. Just take it from here and stitch it there. So, I have taken it here and stitched it there. What have I achieved? The inner layer has become now the outer layer. See, the inner surface has now become the outer surface. Right? So what happens is that the production goes on as normal, 3 ml per day, for example. But the absorption, which was 2.5 ml, because the vessels inside were not adequate to absorb it, they were not efficient to absorb it, now this fluid is being produced from all this area, but getting into the tissues. Tissue has an immense capacity to absorb, right? If sometime you pass IV line and it goes wrong, right? You run a drip and there's a swelling. By the evening it's gone. Why? Because tissues absorb it. So this is the principle. You open up the sac and evolt it. Make the inner lining the outer lining. The inner surface becomes outer. Production goes on as normal, but the absorption, for absorption it has got the previous original vessels. In addition to that, it has not got tissue vessels. So no issues. The issue is resolved. Right? So this is hydrocele. Now we go on to the spermatocele. What is a spermatocele? Please look here on this diagram that, see I mentioned to you this is testes. This is divided into various lobules and each lobule carries uh, what is called a sminiferous tubules which make spermatozoa. Now the spiniferous tubules, as I told you, are this whole section is developed separately embryologically and the epididymis is developed separately. They later come together, right? You know testes develop somewhere there, near the kidneys, and they descend. So these two systems come together, very close together, and then establish communication within each other through was afferentia. So was afferentia exit from the testes and enter the epididymis. But when they are in developmental phase, each of the vas afferentia has to find the epididymis. Right? For example, this blackboard, this whiteboard is the testes and this table is the uh, epididymis. Now a vas afferentia comes out like a sprout, like a tree sprout. You, you plant a seed and Three days later, a small sprout comes up. Now, there's a small sprout and it's looking for what? 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 Epididymis. Ah, I found epididymis. Enters that. So, we have got a connection between the testes and the epididymis. Now, sometime what happens, there is a stupid, silly was a French here. Right? Who sprouts from the testes, and loses its way, looking for epididymis. He cannot find epididymis, he's going the wrong way. So he's lost. So he has got spermato, uh, sminiferous tubule, making sperms, and nowhere to drain it. See, the topmost tube, look at that. So what happens that as the child gains puberty, and spermatozoal production starts, the spermatozoa keep collecting into it, and this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger, and bigger 
there comes a time it is so large patient says I've got three testes two on the right one on the left because he cannot distinguish between it right and that is what it is it's spermatocele right compared to that the uh, cyst of the epididymis is entirely different see this is was this all is was was is a very thick cord if you feel the spermato, uh, spermatic cord the was is like refill of a ballpoint pen it's very thick it's so thick because the wall is very thick and lumen is very small it is this much thick cord with a very small lumen going through it that is why it feels like a cord right now it in the thick wall a small vacuole develops and it's a degenerative vacuole it's just like a boil for example god forbid if you get a small scald because spill of a hot water or hot hot oil on your skin you immediately get a boil right a boil comes on then you get a scald the scalds are boils now if you put a syringe into it and aspirate what sort of a fluid will come out what will it look like water it is body water no so it will look like water so it will look like absolutely like water so this is a degeneration cyst this is a was a french here lost its way gone haywire and still is collecting the sperms and this is uh, hydrocele is tunica vaginalis either producing more fluid or not absorbing enough fluid so these are the three different type of cystic swellings we can differentiate that this is cystic because they are trans eliminating we can confirm that on ultrasound once you confirm it is cystic you can put a needle on it right you clean i mean tell the patient counsel him clean the scrotal skin ordinary 5 cc syringe enter it see do a diagnostic tap right but please make sure you should be 100% sure that this is cystic you must never stick your needle into a solid swelling of testes because it can be a tumor and if it is a tumor and you stick a needle the tumor will glow grow along the needle track and now you have got a testicular and a scrotal tumor so never do that so it is absolutely contraindicated to stick needles into solid tumors solid masses right so only cystic so you have to be 100% sure by your trans elimination and ultrasound so how do we diagnose them we diagnose them that you stick your needle and you aspirate what do you expect will come out of the hydrocele what sort of fluid amber colored like ordinary you put a chest tube you see the fluid comes out the peritoneal you you must have tapped ascites right so the best description probably is the color of the fluid is just like urine it's just like urine the fluid is absolutely like urine and is transparent it is slightly yellow but you can see through it just like you can see through urine so in hydrocel the fluid is like urine and in cyst of the epididymis i told you it's a boil it's a scald so it's just like water and in case of spermatocele what do you expect yeah milky it's a spermatocele it should resemble the semen but in semen right most of the mucus extra comes from here and not from there so it's very thin actually it's not like a semen it's very thin with some spermatozoa on it so the best idea is that if you have a glass of water and you drop two say teaspoons of milk into it it becomes slightly milky but still remains transparent that is how it looks like very slightly milky but still transparent so that is what it is very mildly milky so you see we have not sent patient anywhere we have not left the patient's bed side and we have diagnosed 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 conditions now about the treatment i told you about the treatment of uh, hydrocele but let's discuss this is important to differentiate between two why it is important because you one may think that okay i'm going to explore anyway i'm going to take it away anyway so what does it matter it matters it matters because if it is a spermatocele this is where the spermatocele is going to be and if it is a cyst of the epididymis this is where the cyst of the epididymis is going to be that is a cyst of the epididymis see how close it is to the duct okay 
So if you try to remove this, it's very likely that you will damage this duct. Right. So this is a skull. This is a degeneration within the wall of the epididymis. So if we are trying to take this thing away, we are very, very likely to damage the vas deferens, which means that that side of the test is, as far as spermatogenesis is concerned, goes out of function. Compared to that, if you do a nice dissection, you can dissect it very cleanly, just ligate it from here and take it away. And rest of the system remains intact. So if the person, for example, does not have a family yet, right, or is not married, tell him that we would advise that this is something which is not dangerous at all. Please live with it. It's not going to be anything harmful. Once you have had your family and everything, then come back and we will take it away. Compared to that, because see, when somebody is getting mar uh, married, he's very worried that I've got this abnormality at a very wrong place just before marriage, so I need to get it corrected, right? So please advise, counsel him in case of cyst of epididymis to defer this till they have got the family. I know they have got the other testes, but accidents can happen, right? The other testes can get damaged or something, right? So why take chance? It's nothing. Tell them to sort of postpone the treatment for a little while, right? And then once they have got the family ready, so they can come and we can do that. But in spermatocele, it's okay, right? So this is why it is so important to know Right? Now we come to our question number three, other side. That the question was, is it cystic? The answer was no, it's not cystic. It's solid. And maybe you even confirmed it on the ultrasound as well. No, if it is solid, right? Solid means it's not cystic. It's not transliminating, right? Then the next question is, if I feel it, if I feel it, does it feel like a bag of worms, right? If I feel the whole complex of testes and the swelling, everything, does it feel like a bag of worm? And this is a bag of worm. That if I put it into a shopper bag, right? For example, if I put it into this and feel it from the outside, oh God, there are a lot of earthworms in it. A huh? lot of tubes, right? If that is a feeling, a feeling of a bag of worm, number one. Number two, if you gently squeeze it, it becomes smaller and you release it, it comes back, then it is a varicocele. Because this is a bunch of veins which have dilated. Right, so the diagnosis present actually no dilemma at all. So thereby we leave it. Right, so it's a varicocele and it is treated accordingly. Now, if it is not, it is solid, it's not transliminating, it does not feel like a bag of worm, then the most probable diagnosis left is either a tuberculosis or tumor, which is cancer of the testes, seminoma, teratoma, whatever it is, right? Now, please make sure that you get to a conclusion what it is, right? Because these two present differently, and as I told you, in case of tumor, you must not insert a needle through the scrotum into the tumor because that will seed the scrotum as well. Now, first of all, let's see how the tuberculosis is. Where do you think the tuberculosis is coming from? Lungs. Sorry? Lungs. 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 How come the lung will communicate with blood test? Blood. 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 Sorry? Millery TB. Millery TB, okay. That's a possibility, actually. But the probability is that patient has got renal tuberculosis right, shedding a lot of microbacterium into the urine, which are coming down the urine, and per chance, per chance, sometime they get entry, retrograde entry into the system, just like epididymoarchitis. So it is a tuberculous epididymoarchitis, right? But it is not only a tuberculous epididymoarchitis, it is tuberculous pyelonephritis, tuberculous cystitis, tuberculous seminovesiculitis, tuberculous prostatitis, and tuberculous urethritis, and tuber tuberculous epididymitis, and orchitis. Because, see, the testis is at the end of the line. 
So if the fire is starting from there, it will burn everything to reach up till here. So fire is starting from the kidney, right? So it will affect everything. And there we have our clue. The clue is that you ask patient about renal problems and he will tell you that he has been having pain, loin pains. He is running low grade temperature, all the constitutional symptoms, etc. He may have pulmonary tuberculosis as well, obviously, right? The other thing is that he tuberculosis means he has tubercles in the affected area with caseating necrosis inside, right? He will have tubercles here, tubic tubercles here, tubercles in throughout the vas deferens. So if there are tubercles throughout the vas deferens, how does the vas deferens is going to look like? The vas deferens is going to look like that. Right, so there are tubercles, you feel the vas, and they have got tubercles, and we call the feeling that the vas is craggy. Craggy means it's like a rosary. Tasbij, right? It's a string with a lot of beads in it, like a necklace beads, right? So there are beads, 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 right? So it is called craggy. It's craggy. Now, these seminal vesicles are so soft that normally you cannot palpate them. Now they become hard and they become palpable. Number two, the prostate has got multiple small abscesses into them, right? See what it does to the whole scenario. If I draw it for you, now this patient has got tuberculosis coming from the kidney, right? He has got bladder and he has got urethra and he has got and he has got this with micro abscesses. So he has got a micro abscess here and a micro abscess here and for example a micro abscess here. Now you are doing a rectal examination on this patient. Obviously you are not seeing it, you are only feeling it. So your eyes are closed, finger in his anal canal, you feel anteriorly for the prostate. God, what is that? I draw something else for you. Right, I draw something else for you. What is that? A bull. Feels like a bull's head. The two seminal vesicles become hard and curly like horns. And the prostate itself has got multiple abscesses. Feels like eyes and face and nose. So that's why it's called the bull's head. That's how it looks like. That's how it feels like, I'm sorry. Right? So patient has got a lot of symptoms. And then if you analyze the urine, it has got all the signs and symptoms of pyuria, pus in it. You culture it, the culture result is always negative. Why is that? Culture result always comes back negative. Because it is mycobacterium, it will not grow on normal culture. It needs special cultures. And obviously you are growing it just like an ordinary UTI. So nothing comes up. So that is why it is called erroneously Sterile pyuria. That patient has got pus in the urine, but it is sterile. Actually, it is not sterile. You are not culturing it for the right microorganism. So what is happening? Patient has got a longish history, problem of renal functions, symptoms related to kidney, chronicity, uh, constitutional symptom, fever, malaise, maybe having evidence of tuberculosis elsewhere. You feel that it is solid and not only solid, just like this, the test is too is craggy. It has got tubercles and it has got abscesses. So test is not nice and rounded the way it is. It is sort of like that and like that, right? And the was going is also craggy. So was is craggy, the epididymis is hard and craggy and the test is nodular and the patient has got symptoms and the urine contains a lot of uh, pus but it always comes back negative. You send it for mycobacterium tuberculosis and it will come past positive. Send it for culture on LG media or send for gene expert or whatever, it will come positive. It's tuberculosis. So what should be the treatment? Anti-tuberculosis, right? Right, but that is what it is. So see, that is how we go around it. 
And the last condition is tumor. Now, how does tumor differ from, differs from tuberculosis? See, tumor has got a de novo tumor. There's a testis which glows larger and tumorous and malignant. So instead of having an irregular outline, it is large and regular. It's only very bulky and huge. Will there be anything wrong with the cord, spermatic cord? No. Why? There's nothing wrong with the cord. So cord is normal, but the patient has got a very large and bulky tumor, right? And it is not nodular and irregular. The cord is normal. The PR is normal. Urine is absolutely normal. So what has got, uh, what the patient has got? Tumor, right? Now, the last thing, now that we have come to the conclusion it's a tumor, please, the next step is biopsy. But this must not be a needle biopsy, neither FNA nor trucat, right? It has to be an orchiectomy that will remove the testes for biopsy and remove the primary tumor at the same time. And the orchiectomy too should be done through inguinal route and not through scrotal route because it is easier to give an incision on the scrotum, just get hold of the testes, put a clamp and just chop it away. That should not, must not be done because the reason is that if this is the tumor, right, and if that is the blood vessel going from there, many a time in case of malignancy, a cord of tumor, a snake-like tumor is growing into it. So if you cut it here, this will immediately dislodge and go into the systemic circulation, seedling the lungs, right? So we always do this biopsy through inguinal route, and inguinal route to very close to the, the deep ring, we clamp the cord first and don't handle the testes at all, because if you are handling it, you are risking dislodging it. So you clamp it there and then remove the whole testes, and that goes for biopsy and typing and everything. And other thing you must remember is that I always tell my students that lymph node drainage is very important. Please remember testes drain into periaortic lymph node and not inguinal lymph node. Scrotum drains into uh, uh, inguinal lymph node. If you were foolish enough to do the biopsy, true cut biopsy through skin, no patient has got a testicular and a scrotal tumor. No, he will have lymph node on both places. Otherwise, pure testicular tumors have lymph node mats not here in the, just at the region of amblycus, which is in the periaortic region. And then if they go further, they go into the chest and the neck. Not here, right? So this is how we go around diagnosing it and understanding the principle of how the patient, how, what is the pathophysiology, why it develops in the first place, then how it goes around and uh, how it presents, how can we diagnose it, how can we confirm it, and what are the principles of treatment. I hope you enjoyed it, and um, I hope you will never, ever, ever forget it. Oh, that is the whole point of it. <laughs> Thank you.